Our next speaker does not really need an introduction. Professor Robert John, or simply Israel Uman, from the Hebrew University is a Nobel laureate, a member of the US National Academy of Sciences, as well as the Israel Academy of Sciences and Humanities. He is the academic father, grandfather, grand-grandfather, grand-grand, and so on, father of almost all the game theorists and economic theorists in Israel and in many other places. Um, Professor Uman joined the mathematics department at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem in 1956 and has been there ever since. And as Sergio mentioned, Professor Schmeidler was his second PhD student out of 16, if I counted correctly. <laughs> Professor Uman will talk about his David. David was my uh, second student. So I, I'm going to talk um, uh, about his, his early works, some of his early works. Or, uh, and and uh, I, I see that, uh, and, and, well, let's get started. Uh, okay. Arbe la marati me rabotai. ומי חבריי יותר מרבותיי, ומי תלמידיי יותר מכולן. זה בגמרא, בתענית דף ז עמוד א'. Much have I learned from my teachers, and from my colleagues more than from my teachers, and from my students more than all. So uh, much have I learned in particular from uh, David. And I will start, as I said, with, uh, with um, is, is some of his early works. I'm not sure that all were contained in the doctorate, but uh, it's possible they were. I, I don't remember exactly what was in the doctorate and what was not. Um, so uh, specifically, I'll talk about three contributions. One is the existence of competitive equilibrium in markets with a non-atomic continuum of traders and incomplete uh, preferences. Um, so this, uh, and Andy is going to talk about, Andy Postlewaite is going to talk about uh, uh, competitive equilibrium. Uh, um, markets, and so this may be covered by what he uh, is is going to do, and uh, also uh, um, Sergio mentioned strategic games with a non-atomic continuum of players and their Nash equilibria. Um, so he he was uh, actually the first the first. Uh, um, a scholar to, to talk about uh, strategic games with a, a non-atomic continuum of players. And the third, the third subject that I've listed here is the nucleolus of a, con uh, of a coalitional game. Now, we don't have much time, so uh, I realized as I was writing up the slides uh, for this presentation that uh, the third topic is gonna take a lot more time. So I'm going to, since other people, Andy and, and Aywood, are going to talk about, presumably, the first uh, two items. And I don't want to steal their thunder. Uh, um, and, but, and, and, uh, and I may not have time even to do the third item completely, yes? So, uh, so let me start with the third item, and we'll see how it goes. Okay, so let's talk about the nucleolus. Uh, the nucleolus is a um, concept which is defined for coalitional games. It was defined by David in 1969. Uh, maybe it was part of his thesis, but I'm not sure. Um, and what it does, it associates with each such game a single payoff profile, like the Shapley value. 
but, but uh, quite different from the Shapley value because it's based on strategic considerations and not on, uh, it's not an average, uh, it's not a measure of uh, power, uh, but it's a sort of a central point in the game. And it has many beautiful properties. For example, when the core is non-empty, it's in the core. And in a homogeneous, uh, constant sum weighted majority game, it is a set of weights. It's a single point, OK? Uh, instead of a technical discussion, uh, I'm going to tell a story, OK? I myself get lost in technical discussions uh, in this kind of presentation. So, uh, so uh, maybe some others do also. But uh, anyway, there are uh, non-technical people here, so it's, uh, it's uh, pretty optimal. Um, so in 1980-81, when I was on sabbatical in Stanford, a paper entitled The Problem of Rights Arbitration in the Talmud by Barry O'Neill crossed my desk. Now, I, I had to open my eyes. Barry O'Neill? Talmud? <laughs> yes. Uh, Barry O'Neill is not a particularly Jewish name, OK? And... and uh, um, uh, what is uh, uh, this uh, person doing in the Talmud? Well, it turns out that he really is a, a brilliant uh, um, game theorist, but really not Jewish. And nevertheless, he was studying the Talmud. So that is, is really unusual. Anyway, I, I had a look at the paper, and it was a, indeed a very interesting paper. So I sent it to my son, Shlomo, who was then in the Talmudical Academy in Jerusalem. I was on, sta on, on uh, uh, sabbatical in Stanford. Uh, and uh, I, I, I asked him uh, to uh, take a look at it and see what he thinks. Tell me what he thinks. He wrote back laconically, Dad, take a look at Ktubot, 93a. Well, Ketubot is one of the tractates of the Talmud, and 93a, is, it has standard pagination, okay? 93a is the name of a page, okay? Uh, and uh, I took a look at the page. He, that, that's all he wrote. I still have the letter. Lee was later killed in the, uh, in the Peace for Galilee operation. This was 1980-81, he was killed in 1982. But anyway, I had a look at, uh, at this uh, passage in the Talmud. So I, I did, and a situation is discussed there of a man who dies, leaving an estate that is insufficient to cover his debts. How should the estate be divided? Uh, three cases are considered, okay? The, the, uh, the Talmud, part of the Talmud, the Mishnah, works uh, by example. And, um, and uh, they considered three examples. So here are the three examples. Uh, here it is. There are three, what? Yeah, the 200 should be, yes. You, you try to fight with these computers, yes. Uh, 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 maybe you succeed. I don't succeed. The computer always wins. The computer always wins, yes. Uh, I, I, I don't succeed with them. By the way, I tried to submit a paper today to, to a journal. I sent it to the editor. The editor sent it back to me saying, you have to submit it through the portal. I did not succeed. I got Nathaniel to, to uh, help me. He did not succeed either. I, I guess I won't be able to submit it, OK? Uh, OK? Um, so three cases are considered. When the estate is 100 or 200 or 300, 
silver dinars. And uh, in the case when the, the, the debts are in each of the three cases, there are 100, 200, and 300. Now, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, in, when the when the estate is 100 and the debts are 100, 200, and 300, then the Talmud says to divide equally, okay? Well, <laughs> you know, there's no clear way of doing these things, and that makes some sense. The equal division in that case makes some sense. When the estate is 300, the Talmud says to divide proportionally, okay? 50, 100, 150, that also makes sense, okay? Uh, but it's not equal division, all right? It's, it's something else, so make up your mind. And the middle case, when the estate is 200, is, uh, the, uh, is absolutely mysterious. You know, what's going on over there? It's not equal division, it's not proportional division. What's going on is not clear. So I could not make sense of this, uh, of this passage in the Talmud. And when returning to Jerusalem, I called Mike Marshler, put the uh, table, yes, put the table on the blackboard, not the table in my room, but the table on the previous slide. Uh, and, uh, and we gazed at it. And we tried many game theoretic solution notions, but none of them worked. Finally, one of us suggested, Mike and me, suggested Schmeidler's nucleolus. Okay. Uh, what happened here? Uh, and behold, and what happened was that um, the, the other one of the two of us said, um, you know, uh, um, th that it's, it's unlikely that Schmeidler's nucleolus was known to the sages of the Talmud. It's a very sophisticated concept. It's, it's natural, but it's also sophisticated, and it uses uh, uh, lexicographic minimization and various kinds of things, and it's unlikely that the sages of the Talmud were aware of this. So, uh, um, so the other one said, well, you know, you're right. I buy what you said, but uh, um, what the hell? Let's look at it. Let's see what happens, <laughs> okay? And sure enough, all the nine numbers fitted perfectly. And that was only the beginning. So, yeah, that was, I mean, this should have been point bullet by bullet, but some, some they could, I, I don't get along with computers. Uh, uh, that was only the beginning of the puzzle, okay? What, what, in other words, it really is true that it's extremely unlikely that the uh, sages of the Talmud were aware of the nucleolus. They must have had some other, um, some other justification for, uh, for this solution. And we looked around for an axiomatic characterizations of the nucleolus. Finally, we found an axiomatization by a Soviet, at that time, the Soviet Union still existed, okay? Uh, the, I mean, this is old stuff, yes. <laughs> Speaker is also old stuff. Uh, um, and uh, it, there was an axiomatization by a Soviet uh, game theorist by the name of Sobolev in terms of consistency. And that means, roughly, that restricting the game to fewer players does not change the outcome 
for the remaining players. For example, Nash equilibrium is consistent, okay? If you take a, um, a game and you look at a, a Nash equilibrium of the game, and then you say, well, suppose uh, you restrict the game to fewer uh, participants. In other words, you take a subset of the set of players and you say, suppose the other players play their equilibrium points, you get a new game among the, among that, among the subset. The players outside the subset play their equilibrium strategies, and you have a game between the and the, the uh, restriction of the Nash equilibrium to that subset is a Nash equilibrium of the, uh, of the smaller game. So Sobolev showed that the nucleolus is characterized by consistency and some other minor axioms, but the main, the main axiom is consistency. So in particular, restricting the nucleolus of the Talmud game to two players, to two players, yields the nucleolus of the corresponding two-player game. And that is exactly the solution proposed by the Talmud elsewhere to the problem of two, a two-player game, yes? Namely, equal division of the contested amount. Okay, so I'll give you an example of equal division of the contested amount. And this is a famous example in the, in the Talmud. Two people, huh? Okay, sorry. Uh, two people um, come to court. They're holding a garment, all right? And one says, the garment is mine. I found it. I found it on the street. And the other one says, we found it together. Half of it is mine, okay? So the one that says half is mine, he concedes that half belongs to the other. All right? And the one who says all of it is mine does not concede. He, so the argument is about not about the whole garment, it's about half the garment, right? So the half the garment, the, the, uh, the contested amount is half the garment. So they divide that half and half. So it, the division that's prescribed by the Talmud is three quarters one quarter, and that occurs in various other places in the Talmud, not only in the, uh, in the garment case, it occurs in five or six other places in the Talmud. Okay, so uh, the, the uh, um, nucleolus prescribes that when you restrict the game to two players, give the other players what, the other player, there are three altogether, give the other player what he is supposed to get and restrict the game to two players, then you uh, should, uh, then you will get uh, the equal division the, you will get equal division of the contested amount. That's what the nucleolus says for two player games. For two-player games, equal division of the contested amount, that's what the nucleolus prescribes. I'll give an example, I'll give some examples. So here we have our, um, our uh, 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 the three games under consideration. So let's take two players, let's take the middle case, the mysterious one. In uh, two players, um, uh, yeah, okay, two players are, uh, let's say in the middle one, the, um, the uh, creditor that, uh, who is owed 100 and the creditor who is owed 200. Now, according to that, to the solution that is prescribed there, the one gets 50, uh, the, the, uh, all together, the two of them together, get 125. The third player who is out gets 75. 
Okay, there's altogether 200, so together they get 125. How should they divide 125? Well, uh, the player who, who's, uh, the creditor whose debt is 100 should, is only demanding 100 out of the 125, okay? The other one is demanding 200. Well, there isn't 200, so he's demanding all of the 125. So uh, the creditor, uh, the, uh, the creditor who's owed 100 should get, uh, should get, uh, um, uh, sh concedes 25 to the other one, and, uh, and therefore, uh, the remaining, the contested amount is 100, and that's divided equally, so the answer is 50.75. Okay, I see that my time is up, okay? Uh, I'm 35 seconds over, so uh, it, it, let me just... Uh, um, Let me just finish. Uh, see, I don't get along with these monsters. Let me just finish with this. Theorem. No matter how many creditors there are, no matter what the estate is, and no matter what the debts are, there's always one and only one way to divide the estate among the creditors so that any two creditors divide what they together get in accordance with the rule of equal division of the contested amount. Now, this can be proved. Uh, Mike and I uh, came up with an elementary proof, not via the nucleolus, but we came up with the idea via... David Schmeidler's nucleolus. Thank you.